Well, hey, this is Adam. Welcome back to Rare Classic Cars. Today, in the beautiful twilight here, we're going to talk about my 1969 Lincoln Mark III, an extremely special car that was introduced, this is the first year in the 1969 model year, and really was a brainchild of Lee Iacocca, which this and the Mustang were certainly some of his most successful ideas, where for this car, he basically told the designers, slap a Rolls-Royce grill on a Thunderbird which was an abhorrent directive, you can imagine, to designers at the time, but they did it, and this car proved to be very, very successful for Ford Motor Company. In 1969, as I said, it was its first year. They sold almost 30,000 of these, and it rode atop a Ford Thunderbird chassis, the extended wheelbase Ford Thunderbird, which was used for the four-door Ford Thunderbirds. Remember, by this point in time, there was a two-door Ford Thunderbird as well as a four-door. This took the 117.2-inch wheelbase from the four-door Thunderbird and used it as the basis for this Continental Mark III. And remember back then, the Thunderbird wasn't just another Ford. It really was a luxury car with beautiful fit and finish and interior trim and exterior trim. It was really a great package to begin with. And Lincoln just took it to a whole new level. I think when they introduced this car, they said that it had 200 pounds of sound deadening insulation, and I really don't doubt it. And everything in this car is so high quality, so well made. I think it's probably the best mass produced domestic vehicle of, let's say, the post war era that was reasonably priced. And by reasonably priced, I mean it wasn't just in the stratosphere where it would be the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars. This was a car that you had to make a lot of money to afford, but it still was affordable to some. Clearly 30,000 people bought it in its first model year in 1969, and about 30,000 bought it each year from 1969 to 1971, before the Mark IV was introduced in 1972. And the Mark IV would really be a runaway success where it sold about 50,000 units in its first model year and kind of throughout its run. So this really set the stage for Lincoln having a significantly profitable vehicle that customers really enjoyed. And someday we'll do a comparison of this versus my 69 Eldorado. But for now, trust me when I say that this 69 Mark III, from a quality standpoint, it, the Eldorado just pales in comparison. The Eldorado looks great for sure, but it cannot hold a candle to how this Mark III is built and the materials and the fit and finish and the ride quality. This car is just sublime. And if you get a chance to buy one, they are very complicated cars, but they work very well. I would just say find a good mechanic that can work on them they tend to be reliable. The engines and transmissions don't give you much uh, hassle, but it has automatic climate control, automatic headlamp dimmer. That's what this is. That was an option. So is the automatic climate control. And this car also has cruise control on it, power seats, power windows, rear window defogger. So a lot of different option content on this for the time. And consequently, it's a bit complicated of a car. It even has a number of strange features like hydraulically operated wipers where they're powered off of the power steering pump, not off of an electric motor. So I can actually operate the wipers with the car off if I turn the steering wheel back and forth, and I have a video on that on my channel. But let's take the camera off and walk around this vehicle in this beautiful evening light. And you can see how much, uh, how much the parking lights there just resemble jewelry. Interestingly, the parking lights go off when you turn the headlights on and the headlight doors open. The doors won't open right now because I have the engine off. Or they may open. Yeah, they are opening. But you can see the parking lights go off when I do that. In any case, let's take a look around the vehicle. All right, so let's take a walk around this Mark III. Just an absolutely beautiful vehicle. And as I said, 69 is the first year for this. You can tell the 69s very easily because they have exposed wipers. In 1970, they would have hidden wipers. And the interior is also a one-year-only interior on the 69s. You can see it here with this kind of gathered leather look up here, which apparently Ford Quality Control thought that this was an error and kept rejecting the seats for this car when they would see them, and they had this puckering or gathering. <laughs> and that was actually the designer's intention. They were trying to have this gathered look to make it look richer. 
The door panel's also only one year, kind of funeral casket-ish, but certainly an expensive door panel. You can see here the passenger side. Does have a speaker in it. This car has an AM radio in addition to an A-track tape player, but I believe it has five speakers, two in the rear, two in the doors, and one in the center of the dash. And I gotta tell you, the AM radio in this car sounds phenomenal. Unfortunately, you really can't get too many AM music stations anymore, just talk radio. It does also have the safety door handle here that I was riding in a new Navigator, and they've brought this back. I thought that was a cool touch on the new Navigator. And certainly carpeted lowers. But look at the look at the door hinges on this thing. I mean, this door, this I think is the thickest door on any domestic production car. And unfortunately, this isn't doing it justice. This is immensely huge. And it just closes with this bank vault like thud. <laughs> I mean, it just sounds great. And the windows are all trimmed. This rear window incidentally retracts back into the C pillar. It doesn't go down. These hubcaps weigh about 15 pounds each. And you notice it's got this octagonal theme that some say was inspired by the formula racing where they have the single nut that you take on and off. And others would say it was inspired by early Rolls Royces that had something similar. So I don't know what the Lincoln folks were thinking on this one, but cool looking design. And this would be replicated on the wheel covers for the Mark IV as well, a similar theme. Just a wonderfully proportioned vehicle. You can see here we have the back vent that on the package shelf, you can see there's a big vent here that exhausts out here. And so if you were smoking your cigars inside, you could get good flow through ventilation overall, even with the windows up. This is a faux spare tire that is not real. That's just a design piece. But I think it looks good on this car. And you can see the rear re reverse lights are integrated into the bumper quite handsomely. This car does have the power antenna too, which goes up, and trust me, it goes up a long, long, long way on this car. It almost goes up, I don't know, four feet or something. It's pretty humorous. This hood ornament was installed by the dealer for this owner, and that was kind of typical for these. The car didn't come with a hood ornament originally, and I've debated taking it off. I may at some point, but I came across a number of original design proposals for this car, and they actually had that hood ornament on them. And it was taken off because this was the Ralph Nader era, and it was thought that hood ornaments were going to be outlawed. So really no cars had them, even the El Dorado at the time, that Cadillac always had kind of this stand-up hood ornament for some uh, years didn't have it either. So that was pretty typical in this year. And if we go around to the driver's side, you can see some interesting things. The first is the door locks are vacuum actuated. So watch and listen. Here, here at release. And you can use them for a few times after you shut the key off. It also has this bypass switch where if you want to operate the windows while the key isn't on, see if I hit the driver's side window, nothing happens. But if I hold this bypass and then push this, watch what happens. Kind of a cool feature. So you don't need the key in. That was on other Lincolns as well. It was gone on the Mark IV though. And here we have this beautiful blue green backlighting that was very typical of Fords of the era. I think it just looks very handsome in the evening light. You can tell this is an early Mark III because it doesn't have the yellow index pointers, the orange index pointers, nor does it have the Cartier clock that would come later. And this is the cruise control. If you want to operate the cruise control, you pull this back, I believe. Let me see. Let me turn this on. There, see the little jewel light pops on? 
then you push the end of this stock and that's how you set the cruise control so there now it's off this car is 38,000 original miles when I bought it I think it had 32,000 I've owned this car quite some time almost 10 years I think you can see it has full complement of gauges and this is the rear vent as I was mentioning switch we can close it or open it in the back as you see fit and this is the wiper control that's a continuous speed, continuously variable speed. So as opposed to being intermittent where you know to wipe and then wait, wipe and then wait, the wipers just operate, you can have them operate very slowly. So they wipe very slowly or wipe very fast. Just a bit different approach. Of course, this car is tilt wheel, which for Ford's meant you push this lever forward and that moves the wheel. You always think you're gonna break that stock when you do that but you're not this car does not have the anti-lock brakes it just has disc brakes on it but you could on mark threes get the sure track system and on the mark fours as well but like i said this car does not have it i do like how when you have the parking lights on there's this ring around the keyhole so you can find where it is where to place your key because this is an impossible spot it's an anti-theft feature almost on this car. For 69, it's the only year where this key, you put it in down there, you insert it down there. In the 70 and 71 model year, you'd insert it on the column. Buyer beware if you get one of these. This has the gear shift that tends to wear out, and then the cars will jump from park to reverse unknowingly so do not leave this car idling and unfortunately you can't even leave it idling with the emergency brake set because if the car engages reverse the brake automatically releases so just shut the car off don't leave it unattended especially with the fast idle on that was a problem with these the gear shift lever has this great feel to it very smooth action but it the park paw is not that strong and oftentimes you can see if you just tug gently on these gear shifts that it'll go into reverse. So what often happened is people would close the door and then the car would jump into reverse. So be careful on these classic Fords if you own them. Let's take a look under hood. This has the premium fuel 460 cubic inch V8. If I could open it with one hand. There we go. And Ford was so proud of it, they put this data plaque here that says it's 365 brake horsepower at 4,600 RPM. This is a premium fuel 460. The 460 was exclusive to Lincoln during these years until partway through the 1972 model year when it would become optional on other Ford products. And this car is very peppy, I will say especially for a big, big car. And this engine is so quiet. There's the cruise control servo, headlamp vacuum tank, another vacuum tank. Just a wonderfully smooth engine, like I said, that's very powerful. And these headlamps, that's the actuator motor down there that pulls these open. I've replaced that, so they were failing and I've also recorded the radiator on this car. So if I'm operating the air conditioning, this big 460 doesn't get very hot. Now it always runs cool. This, by the way, is just a power steering reservoir. That's not a pump. There's no belt on there. The power steering pump for 1969 is driven off of the front of the crankshaft on these cars. That was a holdover from the MEL V8s. 1970, they would go to a GM-style Saginaw steering pump on these. It does have the two-piston York compressor, which actually works great on this car, still charged on its original R12 Freon, and it's icy cold. Let's take a look in the trunk. And compared to the Mark IV, the trunk in this Mark III is gargantuan. The Mark IV trunk is pitiful for as big as that car is. But this Mark III trunk is very, very nice. You can see it's a deep well trunk. Original spare there, which is a triple stripe white wall. The Mark III, I believe, was the first American car to 
have standard radial tires on it in 1970. It came with Michelin radials, but 1969 had triple stripe bias ply white walls. And again, deep well trunk here on the Mark IV, the gas tank is here, so it's not a deep well, and it's a pitiful trunk. I mean, I would have been very upset if I were a Mark III owner and I traded in a Mark IV. You can barely fit anything in a Mark IV trunk, whereas this thing is gargantuan and nicely trimmed too. That's the rear floor mat down there. And the jack is over here under this little flap. So I'll start it up and you can hear this engine run. Before we take off, I thought I'd show up here you have these various lights that illuminate. If you turn the key on, you'll see the door ajar comes on. And a trunk light as well as a seatbelt light and a headlamp light to tell you if the headlight doors aren't working. And let's see, let's try to extend this radio antenna. I've got to turn the key on for that, I think. There we go. Still going, still going, still going. There we go, all the way up. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Pretty tall. All right, let's take it for a drive. So here you go, I'll go from the parking lights to the headlights and you'll notice this little keyhole won't be illuminated anymore and also the headlight indicator will come on. You can hear the vacuum and now the headlights are on. So here we go. Such a smooth ride. Just everything about this car says quality. I would have been so happy with this purchase. There's a turn signal. By the way, when I bought this car, the turn signal was flashing pretty fast. I thought that was odd. I noticed that the battery was bubbling and it led me to realize that the battery was overcharging. The gauge wasn't really indicating a significant overcharge. But interestingly on these, then I thought, well, I gotta just replace the voltage regulator. Then I was searching for the voltage regulator. Where is it on this car? Well, it's a separate piece on the back of the alternator, believe it or not. It's removable. And I bought one on eBay. I think they're hard to find now. But I searched forever. This was back in the days before internet forums were really that great. And I didn't have a shop manual at the time. So I thought that was just a little funny tidbit. If your car is overcharging, or you're trying to find the voltage regulator, this it's on the back of the alternator. While this car does ride very well, it is a bit wallowy when you handle the turns. But that's the price you pay for a good ride, and who's going to be flying around corners in this thing anyway? Seriously. So here we are going down the road. Just a wonderful ride in this vehicle. The only thing I would say when you compare it to the El Dorado is that the steering is less precise. The GM steering gear, I think, is just better than Ford's. This is a pretty slow steering gear. And maybe the engine is, I would say, equally smooth. The C6 transmission, though, shifts more harshly than the GM Turbo Hydromatics. Aside from the Turbo Hydromatic 200, which is a bit of a firm shifter. I remember when I first got this car, I had never owned a Ford before and or at least a classic Ford. I only owned GMs by that point. This is my first Ford that I bought. And I remember I loved the car, I loved everything about it, but I thought the transmission was gonna go out because it shifts so harshly. And that's, that's just how they shift. They talked to a old school transmission guy and he drove his and he just laughed. He's like, no, that's how they all shift. And now having owned, I don't know, 20, 30 classic Fords, yeah, they do all shift like this. Doesn't matter. C6, C4, FMX, they're all like this. So it's just how they are. Not bad, just different. But it's a great car to just be kicked back, relaxed. There's no noise in this cabin. I'm going 45 or so. There's a little bit of exhaust rumble because 
I have dual exhaust on here. They do have resonators, but you can't quite get the same quality as these cars had brand new. Still, whisper quiet, sublime ride, wonderful view over that hood. Aside from the fact that the car is dusty from all the pollen in the air at this time of year. In any case, hope you enjoyed this review of this Lincoln Mark III. Thanks for coming along for a drive. Until next time, check out the video thumbnails for some suggestions for you.